Good afternoon, friends and newcomers to the South Orange Library Special Conversations with Special People. Today, I have a wonderful and special guest, and she's also a friend, Joanne Middleton, um, author and professor emeritus of English at Drew University and former director of medical humanities at Raritan Bay Medical Center. Um, you have given talks throughout the years, but I, for, you first spoke here on January 10th, 1991, on your book, Willa Cather, Modernism, and on the, um, on the rediscovery of Willa Cather. And you may even mention me in the book because you came to the desk and I said, I love Willa Cather. <laughs> but in any case, I don't have that book to hold up. Obviously, I'm not in the library now. Since then, Joanne has spoken in January of every year on a variety of different topics, all very interesting and informative and different. Um, some of the topics, Humane Doctors of Tomorrow, where you told doctors how to read books on ethics so that they would realize that people are connected to the blood tests as well. Um, you were wonderful. Contemporary ethical issues in literature, images of aging in literature. Well, um, literary art, and the medical mind. What makes a country music, which is completely different. I know your son is so talented and that was great. And you spoke on Nashville and you spoke about the book by Harper Lee, Go Set a Watchman, another reflection on personal morality. I love that book and I was so thrilled you did that. And um, January 4th, 2018, you spoke Beginnings, which was, we're doing it again you're doing the beginnings of the new year 2021 but today you're speaking about something that i told people you're speaking on three pines in a pandemic and i let them wonder what it is so i can't wait to hear it and so please let's i just want to say thank you for all the years you have donated your time and talent to us and it gives me great pleasure to introduce our special guest and my friend Joanne Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you. Um, yeah. Three Pines is a place that doesn't really exist. If any of you are detective story aficionados, as you know I am, because I talked about that once too, you know that I love mystery stories and I love series about detectives. My favorite is a series written by Louise Penny, a Canadian author who has created a whole world and uh, that world surrounds one of the kindest, most wonderful men I've ever met, other than my husband, who feeds him out. <laughs> Good. This is the first time that Armand Gamache sees the village of Three Pines. It's in the first book of the series called Still Life. Three Pines wasn't on any tourist map, being too far off any main road or even secondary road. Like Narnia, it was generally found unexpectedly and with a degree of surprise that such an elderly village should have been hiding in this valley all along. Anyone fortunate enough to find it once usually found their way back. And Thanksgiving in early October, we're in Canada, remember, was the perfect time. The weather was usually crisp and clear. The summer scents of old garden roses and fox were replaced by a musky autumn leaves, wood smoke, roast turkey. As he comes into the village, Three huge pine trees faced the marsh at the far end of the green. Between him and them was a pond, a bunch of sweater clad children circling it, hunting for frogs, he supposed. The village green sat, not surprisingly, in the center of the village, a road called Commons circling it with homes. Except behind him, which seemed to be the commercial district, it was a very short commercial district. It consisted, as far as the marsh could see, of a depot where the Pepsi sign read Bellevue. Beside that was the boulangerie, the bistro, and a bookstore. Four roads led off the commons, like the spokes of a wheel or the directions of a compass. 
As he sat quietly and let the village happen around him, he was impressed by how beautiful it was. These old homes facing the green with their mature perennial gardens and trees, by how natural everything looked undesigned. And the pall of grief that settled in this little community was worn with dignity and sadness and a certain familiarity. The village was old and you don't get to be old without knowing grief and loss. Three Pines, a place of solace, refuge, and of course murder because that's what he's there to investigate. Let me tell you a little bit about Louise Penny because that explains much of the reason I think we need Three Pines. Penny was born in Toronto, 1958. Her mother was an avid reader of both fiction and nonfiction with a particular liking for crime fiction. And Louise grew up reading mystery writers such as Agatha Christie, Georges Simenon, Dorothy Sayers, and Michael Innes. She earned a Bachelor of Applied Arts in Radio and Television from Ryerson Polytechnic Institute in 1979. And after graduation at 21, she embarked on an 18 year career as a radio host and journalist with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. She was a radio journalist in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Thunder Bay, Ontario, Montreal, and Quebec City. At the start of her broadcasting career, she took postings at locations far from friends and family. And to help with feelings of loneliness and isolation, she increasingly turned to alcohol. She said she turned to alcohol to help her deal with a gnawing loneliness, self-loathing and fear that had buffeted her since she was a teenager. And by age 35, had contemplated suicide. I had developed an unhealthy worldview, which was that the world is a scary place filled with people who want to or are capable of doing harm, she said. I know what it's like to hate yourself so much that you have to murder yourself. Coming out the other side gave me a profound belief that goodness exists. <laughs> she read these words. Uh, it's a line from Auden in his Elegy to, to Melville, where he talks about goodness. Goodness existed. That was the new knowledge. His terror had to blow itself quite out to let him see it. His terror had to blow itself quite out to let him see it. She had just turned the corner. She said, I was close enough that I could still feel the vestiges of terror, but I was also feeling that incredible awakening of hope of how beautiful the world is and how beautiful people are. That realization, she said, became the leitmotif of her books. So the books are about terror, but they're really about goodness and the relationship these characters have with each other. Age 35, she admitted to an alcohol problem and has been sober since. Shortly afterward, she met her future husband. Ms. Penny credits a call to Alcoholics Anonymous and falling in love with her husband, Michael Whitehead, head of hematology at Montreal, Montreal Children's Hospital for saving her life. She moved to a town called Knowlton with her husband. It's a town uh, not too far north of the Vermont border in what's called the Eastern Townships of Quebec. The village gave Penny a sense of community that she had been looking for. I had spent a lot of time moving around, she said, wanting nothing more than home and roots. I found that here. The books are many things, probably least among them, crime novels. They are definitely crime fiction, but they are love letters to the place I choose to live. I have never been made to feel a stranger in Knowlton. 
Michael and I were welcomed and embraced. It feels like there was always a place at the table just waiting for us. Much of my life I wandered geographically and emotionally searching for home. I found it in the Eastern townships of Quebec. I found it with Michael. I found it very deep inside myself. And that's what I write about, the yearning to belong, the search for home. Penny had always wanted to write and her husband said, okay, fine, we'll move here. You give up the, the radio and the television. I will support us both and you write. So she began a historical novel, which she researched and which went absolutely nowhere. Looking at the books on her night table, she realized they were all mysteries. And encouraged by her husband to drop the historical novel, she wrote her first gamache, Still Life. To be honest with you, she says, when I was writing this book, I didn't ever think it would be published. And I knew it would take years, probably, to write the first book of the series. Not the series, just this book. I wanted to write books that my eight-year-old self would read. I created a village where I would live, populated with characters I would befriend and a main character that I would marry. So I created a cast of characters. I would choose as friends because I knew I was going to have to be in their company for at least a couple of years while I wrote the first book. This was just after 9-11. And having been a journalist for a long time, I was getting the sense that the world was a very cruel, very dangerous place. And I didn't like that feeling because in my heart, I thought that probably wasn't true. It was a warped version of what the world was really like. And so I created this village, the one I choose to live in, where real life happens. Bad things happen to all of the people but there is a sense of community, of belonging. I tried to instill some of that in this book, but Three Pines is a village that isn't on any map. There's a sense that it's only ever found by people lost. No one goes there on purpose. They kind of bumble into it, but the people who do find it were meant to find it. Three Pines is intentionally a hyper ideal village, beautiful and peaceful at least on the outside. It plays into another theme throughout the series, one of duality, the difference between perception and reality, between what we say and what we're really thinking, between the public face and the inner turmoil. The name has, a, has historical significance. Legend has it that during the American Revolution, the trees were a signpost for loyalists to the British crown fleeing with, to Canada to safety. So what people would do, they would plant a cluster of three pine trees on their home when they were at the border as a signal to these people that they were safe. And that's how I got the name for the village, she says. Her main character was inspired by her late husband. He was the director of hematology, as I said, at Montreal Children's Hospital, what Penny calls the worst job in the world, including homicide detective. And yet he chose to live with joy, just like Gamache, because he understands there was a privilege to make a choice. She credits him, and he died in, in uh, 2016, for helping to tame her demons. It was a slow, painful process. Michael developed dementia. Not only was he gamache in so many ways for me, he was also so supportive of the books. No Michael, no books. And to lose Michael, I was afraid I was going to lose my attachment to gamache and to all the characters in the books. You lose the desire to write, you lose all the joy. I was gonna take a year off, at least after Michael died. I found myself after about six months sitting at the laptop with a cafe au lait and a croissant wanting to write. 
and not wanting to write because I had to. The publishers were great. They said, take as much time as you want, but with a joy I hadn't felt in a long time. I found a new freedom. What I discovered was far from losing Michael, Michael became immortal. I can visit him anytime. The writing became a harbor, it became a solace. It became a world I could control. Oddly enough, all the decisions I had made 12 years ago about a place I would like to live in and people I would choose as friends turned out to be my saving grace. The hub of Three Pines is the village green around which the Bistro Bookstore, Bakery and the B&B are all grouped and where the three trees grow within walking distance of the homes of the oddball inhabitants. Ruth, the cranky but renowned poet who nurtures a foul-mouthed duck. Rosa. Myrna, a retired psychologist who owns the cozy bookstore. Clara, the artist whose work is far more complicated than it appears. Gabri and Olivier, who run the bistro and the B&B, gay men who have found a home in this tolerant town. And Armand and his wife, Ren Marie, who adore one another after 35 years of marriage. In my opinion, Three Pines is the most magical place on earth in spite of the homicides. There's a bookstore, a bakery, a bed and breakfast, a bistro where everyone sits by the fire, has a drink, eats the most amazing food prepared by Gabri. They have blizzards, they have pets, some drink too much, they care for one another. They have past and histories that make them who they are today. They stick together, they are friends. Penny has said, my books are about many, many things, probably least of all murder. They're about life. They're about choices and taking responsibility for what you do. But really, I think at their heart, they're about love and friendship and food. All of the characters eat exceptionally well. It's usually winter in Three Pines. Penny seldom sets her story in spring or summer. The frigid Canadian weather allows the residents to gather around fires in the bistro or in the home of one friend or another, to share bowls of steaming soup and fresh bread, to demonstrate physical and emotional warmth, and of course, to help the wise and indestructible Chief Inspector Armand Gamache work out his latest mystery. The warmth is more potent when pitted against intense cold. The light is stronger when compared with the dark. And it's evil easy to overlook that Penny writes a good deal about evil and violence because they just become dark shadows in an otherwise hospitable world. The mystery part of her novels is incidental. We're there for the people. Because of the warmth and closeness of its residents, Three Pines feel solid and true, an enviable combination in this brittle world we seem to be living in. Three Pines is not just a place to find goodness, but it is safe. Perhaps more ironic since it is the setting of more than a dozen murders. And yet a sense of community and living a good life always prevails in Three Pines. That sense of community, the yearning that we all feel. I think that one of the reasons the books are successful are causing borders and cultural groups and ethnic groups and language groups is because we have certain things in common. And one of the things I think is we really want to belong, says Penny. I get so many emails from people about the bistro and wanting to sit in the bistro with that group of friends where people are accepted. If we lived in Three Pines, we could be shielded from the outside nastiness. And we sure have a lot of nastiness this, this week. We'd be shielded by people who get what being human is all about. Those people are there for one another. 
They had the savvy but immensely kind Gamache outsmarting drug cartels, replacing dirty cops, mentoring a younger generation of misfits and finding his own safety in the little town that charmed him so much he moved there from Montreal. Three Pines is a place where women find their talent, often late in life, like Penny, who published her first book when she was 45. And I need to just throw this in because it rings bells with me. Willa Cather also published her first novel when she was 45. Cranky Old Ruth is a renowned poet who shares her wisdom on the page and occasionally in person whose heart seems made of stone because she fears kindness kills, but who quietly comes to the aid of those needing it most. Who knows how old she is? Penny never makes that entirely clear, though she is obviously older than dirt, when she finally wins the Governor General Award. Clara becomes a respected and popular artist when she steps out of her husband's shadow, although her hair remains a delicious mess. Myrna gives up the stress of her job as a psychologist because her clients showed no interest in changing. And she accidentally finds this hidden town that feels like home where she should have been all along. Perhaps the most important part of Penny's imaginary world is its embrace of the silly, even the absurd. We need silly and we need some absurdity like Rosa the duck, that's Ruth's duck, Rosa, whose only word rhymes with duck. Clara, whose hair is a food magnet, making her look like, and I quote, Carmen Miranda of baked goods. Gabri, the drama queen, whose partner thinks his feelings are so raw, he must have been born inside out. And the fact the doors are never locked in town except during harvest time to prevent neighbors from dropping off baskets of zucchini. At one point, Jean-Guy Beauvoir, that's um, Gamache's second in command, looks at himself in his car's mirror and realizes his image was closer than it appeared. Clara feels a bit like Penny's alter ego an artist longing to find recognition and appreciation who ultimately soars because of her talents, but who is often socially maladroit and downright hilarious. At one point, she basked in bubble bath given to her by her judgmental upper crust mother-in-law who normally gives her cooking products, even though Clara hates to cook. Ultimately, Clara, learns the woman had actually given her a soup mix as she looks back at her bath water to see a pea floating next to a rehydrated carrot. We've lost our sense of silliness and Penny has found it for us. One of the most hilarious, I'm gonna talk just about two of the characters in a little more depth. One of the most hilarious, lovable, and outrageous characters is the old woman, Ruth Zardo, the poet. Ruth is an enigma of sorts. Canada in the series, but not in real life, knows the poetry of, poetry of Ruth Zardo, but few would ever recognize her or know her. Her latest book of poetry is titled, I'm Fine, capital F I capital I, capital N, capital A, fine. That title has become a running joke among those who are familiar with Louise Penny's books. Gamache's wife, Ren Marie, a librarian, is the first to comprehend the significance of Ruth's title, pointing out that in her experience when people use capital letters, it's because the letters stand for something. Your title is I'm fine with fine in capitals. Ruth says she has brains, your wife. She's the first to notice that, or at least to ask. Now there's a bad word in here, so I'm going to just skip the bad word, but you all can fill it in. Fine stands for effed up, insecure, neurotic, and egotistical. I'm 
fine. <laughs> Penny has said, I love how many people respond to this phrase and recognize themselves as I recognize myself. One of the great joys of writing Ruth is her degree of self-awareness. She's embittered and angry and loving and brilliant, and she can laugh at herself. She is, all capitals, fine. Now that brings me to a more serious point. Several times during this most devastating of years, friends have asked me, how are you? And I reply, I'm fine. Or I ask the friend, how are you getting along? And he or she has replied, I'm fine. Here's the key thing to know. I'm fine is all right. I'm fine, all capitals, according to Ruth Zardo, isn't. And when our friends are all capitals fine, we need to check on them. The other part of that is if we can't escape to Three Pines from the world we're living in, we can at least give ourselves permission to be all capitals fine. And now a few words about Armand Gamache. When I gave the first penny book to a dear friend, she read it and called me and said, I want to marry Gamache and run away to Three Pines. And I said, well, that's gonna be kind of tricky because of Ren Marie. But that's a lot of people's reactions to this wonderful character. When she set out to create her central character, Penny recalled reading that Agatha Christie grew weary of Hercule Poirot. She remembers thinking, if the books are published and I live with him for the rest of my life, do I really want a main character I find annoying? She took many walks and it occurred to her just to create a character I would marry, give him all the qualities I admire, not just in a man, but in a human being and not a perfect man, because that would be very annoying, but someone who struggles to be decent. And so her husband, Michael, was the inspiration for Amon Gamache, kind, thoughtful, generous, a man of courage and integrity, who both loved and accepted Love's limits. Gamache's approach to managing and mentoring the early career detectives assigned to his unit is unique. He usually gets the ones that are on their last legs, about to be kicked out of the force, uh, who are very strange and who have uh, their own idiosyncrasies. So he is talking to Isabel. There are four things that lead to wisdom. You ready for them? She nodded, wondering when the police work would begin. There are four sentences we learned to say and mean. Gamache held his hand up as a fist and raised a finger with each point. I don't know. I need help. I'm sorry. I was wrong. At some point in every single one of the books, Gamash has the opportunity to instruct one of his trainees with those principles. He advised another of his trainees, life is choice all day, every day, who we talk to, where we sit, what we say, how we say it and our lives become defined by our choices. It's as simple and complex as that, and as powerful. All of the Gamache novels are at their core about love and friendship, about belonging and hope, and finding kindness buried in the wilderness, in the marrow. Amash's wisdom is never more clear than when he shares with one of his colleagues advice he was given at the start of his career. Before speaking, you might want to ask yourself three questions. Is it true? Is it kind? Does it need to be said? You need to choose 
after you ask those questions. In How the Light Gets In, Penny writes that Armand Gamache had always held unfashionable beliefs. He believed that light would banish the shadows, that kindness was more powerful than cruelty, that goodness existed even in the most desperate places. He believed that evil had its limits. The made up village of Three Pines, which Penny tongue in cheek informs readers can't be found on any map, although her publisher has conveniently drawn one, is meant to be a safe place, a refuge or a sanctuary for people who are lost. Penny considers the book's allegories in Three Pines a state of mind, a place we find only when we're lost, when we need it, and not home to everyone. She says, Abla, been lost in my life and tired of sarcasm and dark cynicism. i would had too much of that. It drained me, left me hollow and callow. I needed belonging and kindness. I needed friendship, a warm heart on a cold night. That's three pines. But like the marsh, while it's good, it isn't perfect. There's always a serpent, even in paradise a shadow to the light. The attractions of Three Pines are clearly immense, but so are its dangers. As Beauvoir says, where else would the devil go but to paradise? And that's what makes Three Pines what it is and the people who they are. They're about duality and belonging, community and love. Louise Penny has said, I think of Three Pines as a state of mind, a village occupied by people who have made conscious choices in their lives, not because they've never been hurt, not because they're too protected or foolish or shallow to know that the world can be a dreadful place. No, it's for that very reason they've all made their choices. They've all been hurt, as have we all. But when wounded, some people become embittered, cynical, sarcastic. They hurt back. But some, and I sometimes think they're the ones most wounded, make another choice. They know nothing good comes of giving in to our darker instincts. And so they turn to what Lincoln in his second inaugural address called the better angels of our nature. Three Pines is a place where kindness trumps cruelty, where people help each other and care, where sharing isn't a word to be laughed at, and even an embittered old poet is welcomed. She says, three pines is a state of mind. When we choose tolerance over hate, kindness over cruelty, goodness over bullying, when we choose to be hopeful, not cynical, then we live in three ponds. And that's why I think that we need three pines in this pandemic. I think that it's been very hard on everyone. We've seen so much cruelty and loss and sadness and absurd situations that we need to find the three pines state of mind. Now, I want to, if I had enough time, and I think I do, uh, I wanted to read you something that appeared in the New York Times Magazine section on November the 25th, this year. And I opened it up and I thought, oh my God, we are all villagers of Three Pines. This was uh, a food, a food article by Dory Greenspan. And here's what she says. At the start of the pandemic, as we all made plans to stay put, a friend said, how I wish I could be in Three Pines. I understood. 
Three Pines is a small village in Quebec with a good boulangerie, a bookstore that smells like tea and flowers, a bistro with an excellent chef, and a community of fascinating eccentrics. There's the poet Ruth, who often curses and just as often says something so profound you want to tuck the line away in your pocket. There's Clara, the brilliant artist whose dinners last into the night because the conversations are so good. And there's Chief Inspector Armand Gamache, whose job is to investigate murders, but whose remarkable gift is to understand people. I'm obsessed with him, with his love of literature, his quiet intelligence, his aftershave, some combination of sandalwood and rose water. It doesn't hurt that he likes a black licorice pipe, my mother's favorite candy, with his cafe au lait, with his scotch too. Since I've read through all of her books, all of which include family, mystery, murder, naughty moral dilemmas, goodness lost, goodness found, dogs, a duck, children, very old people, and food, lots of it. There has been a lemon meringue pie in each of Penny's books, starting with her second, A Fatal Grace, where a fisherman in a diner finishes a slice and then looks toward Gamache, his eyes shining with compassion. Ever since the pie, which was Louise's husband's favorite, has, quote, come to symbolize the divine, she says. It's now a touchstone for her readers as well as Gamache. The last novel that she wrote, this, this uh, one that was just published, apparently she's got one at the, uh, at the publisher now being ready for next year, but this last one, All the Devils Are Here, takes place not in Three Pines, but in Paris. But it ends up with Gamache home again in Three Pines, enjoying a slice of lemon meringue pie at the bistro. Dory Greenspan says, as I closed the book a couple of months ago, I felt as if I too had returned home and I set about doing something I'd never done. I baked lemon meringue for an imaginary friend, Armand Gamache. And so I think that any place, any set of characters, that can give us such solace, such comfort in the chaotic time in which we live is a place we need during this pandemic, during this time of political upheaval, during the personal traumas we're suffering. And that's why I want to be a villager in Three Pines. How's that? <laughs> Absolutely beautiful. You could have been a psychologist. You, what you were saying, it wasn't a book review. It was really talking about life and kindness and, and understanding other people and not and making it all important. That's what she does. The books, you know, I have to go back after I was preparing for this and I thought, oh my goodness, I have to go back and start at the beginning again and read them because I need to really immerse myself in three pines. Well, it, it, it's perfect for the beginning of the year for people to understand whatever they're going through, other people are going through it in a different way. <laughs> We're all it's fine. <laughs> We're all fine, small, small letters and capital letters. <laughs> and also rec recognizing that not everyone is just like you or think like you. Mm -hmm. So if they're different, who cares? It's their lives. Absolutely. Not, you know, being judgmental in, in that village, the people accepted people as they were. They weren't judging them, talking about them, um, making less of them and more of themselves. Absolutely right. That's, that's a very significant point. And well, you really nailed it. <laughs> I loved it. I loved your talk. And I'm reading one of the, the books now. And I oh. wait, it's <laughs> wait a minute. Let me just get to the book. Hold on one second. If someone else has a question, please ask ask it. Yeah. Um, I do have a question. Yes. 
um, well, more more so a comment, I guess, than, than a question. It was it was fascinating the perspective that um, that Penny has, given the struggles that she faced in life, and how she was able to overcome those struggles and come out of the other side, um, not just needing a place of solace, but sharing that place of solace with others via her writing, which I thought was really great. Absolutely, and, and this is the reason that I spend so much time talking about her husband because she really credits him with pulling her out of that bad place. Mm -hmm. And given that we're all, as you say, dealing with um, challenges and struggles during the mm -hmm. last I guess, 10 months at this point, it's just going on and on. Um, so I guess from my perspective, I think it's really valuable to have a place of solace that we can find ourselves within our own homes, because that's where we are, within yes. our own space, with our own spirit, our souls, our minds, um, just to maintain a sense of sanity and balance in our lives. But, but at the same time, I think we need, to, we need to be motivated to be productive in some way, um, to be um, kind to ourselves by not making ourselves feel bad if we don't get things done, but to also embrace the opportunity to improve, explore, um, identify things that you may want to learn or enhance and to be brave enough to actually do those. Those things while you have the time and the opportunity to do them. I think that your choice of the word brave is inspired because, you know, we can get into this staying at home. We have to shelter in place. We have to draw ourselves into our shells, and that's what we do. Mm -hmm. But you're right in saying we've got to reach down. We've got to find solace, and we have to be brave enough to do that. We have to be brave enough to try different things. I have a question. Mm -hmm. With Jean Guy's drug addiction is a way of Penny's working through her own addictions. I think that you're absolutely right. I, and I think she gives him um, a great many of the terrors she herself felt. And, you know, it's um, Dimash's daughter who pulls him through. Just as her husband, and, and he marries her. It's, it's his wife that manages to pull him through as Michael pulled her through. You know, there's a whole nother um, tension going through the books as the characters develop, the father-son uh, set up, the, the parent, who's the parent? Mm. And I guess also with um, the understanding that, that her husband went through a very, very debilitating condition and mm -hmm. uh, disease yes. that I'm sure she lived with him. Yes. And for him to have been her savior from the demons that she had faced all her life, that must have been very traumatic for her to lose him. And when you have some sort of a cognitive disability, it's mm -hmm. the constant drip of losing a person every day. Yes. You're losing some aspect of them every day. Um, so I, I applaud her for being able to come back from that, given the importance that he, he was, that he, the important place that he actually had in her life and her recovery and her ability to live a very rich life um, and still move on to write these books and write them in a very warm, loving, you know, compassionate way. Mm -hmm. One of the things she has said is that throughout the course of his dementia, until his death, he retained his joy in life. He retained his ability to love and his joy. And that was what she saw as the core of him. That all the, all of the other things she lost, she said his joy remained. And that was a blessing. Yes, which I and think is a blessing. blessing. <laughs> and it's a blessing that she understood that. Mm -hmm. 
she's really very funny. She has a um, a website um, and a blog. You know, she does a blog. And I just saw one of the funniest things I have seen posted. Uh, this won't come off quite as well as it does when you see the video. Uh, she posted a video with two elderly people, a man and a woman, a couple. And the narrator says, well, we're going to have to go back. You know, the pandemic has, has reasserted itself and we're going to have to put some measures in place. And so you have to, you have choices. You know, we talked about paying okay, things. Choices are important. We have choices. And A, you can remain in the same house with each other and no one else. And the woman goes, B. <laughs> I'll take B. <laughs> can I please have B? I've actually seen um, a video of that earlier in the pandemic where uh -huh. there is a gentleman maybe in his 30s being asked that question you have a choice you can a is you can stay at home mm -hmm. with your wife and your children or and then he yells b yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, i just, i love that so around our house you know we look at each other and go b <laughs> when things get unmanageable I can see why you were so wonderful when you were teaching oh. medical ethics and the books that you read, read and had them, the, your students, the student doctors read. Um, do you remember that talk you gave? I do. I remember, yes, I remember teaching that, yes. Yes, you know, um, actually, John and I were talking about this. Oh, this by the way, tell them that your husband is a very famous doctor, so please tell well, them about he, John. He is, he's an infectious disease doctor, so of course, all of this is playing right into his, his field. He, he's loving all this. Well, I mean, not loving it, but he's <laughs> very interested in how everything is happening. Um, did you see, this is off topic, and I realize it's a tangent. So that means I'm not demented. I know it's a tangent. Did you see the doctor, the black female physician who caught coronavirus, went to the hospital, was sent home, came back to the hospital and posted a video saying that no one would listen to her. And she died, subsequently died. Did, did you see that news story? Yes. Okay. I said to my husband, you know, this was exactly the reason I had one short story that I taught to medical residents and it was about a black woman delivering a baby. And in the course of the short story, the doctors come around, it's told from the woman's point of view. And she said, they just look at me and they say, look, they're just like animals. They just have these babies and they don't hurt. And the narrator says, at that point, I yelled and screamed because I thought they ought to know I heard every much as those white women they were coddling. Mm. And I said to John, I hope, I hope that some of the doctors we taught remember that story when they hear about this woman because it's, it's there, it's still there. You know, that, that was the whole point when you said, what, what did you teach, the books you taught? That was one of the things that just hit me the other day. Well, that, that means that people are caring and, sh and sharing their love, not their, like right. you said, what's the happening. The bigotry. <laughs> yeah, the bigotry. Yes, yes. And, and that's taught, I think, from childhood. Mm -hmm. I think if you're raised by loving parents who love people and who love being kind to others and everything, you have to turn out that way. But I, th I, I really believe that, you know, it starts from- oh, it's, uh, What is that? Um, you have to be carefully taught from South Pacific? Yeah. 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 And I once heard the church say, give me a child for the first five years. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Jesuits. Yeah. <laughs> it's 
The Jesuits will fix you up. You start off little. <laughs> oh, you were wonderful. Oh, and oh, here's so here's the book that I'm reading, A Better Man. Oh, and yes, that's that's the one right there next to the last one. That's I'm, next. I'm ashamed that and I used to be able to read a book really quickly, but I'm afraid <laughs> I've been addicted to the politics and watching too much television about what's happening. And I'm so afraid of missing out on something. Oh, I know. This is the first time I can't finish a book fast because it, like I said, things are changing every single day. God knows what's happened since we got on here. I, I mean, know. <laughs> I know, but there is no simpler time and maybe you have to learn that. And maybe this pandemic, if anything, the kindness of strangers, the kindness of other people. Yes. And it's, that's why we need three times. We need to have that state of mind. That, that's something we need to, to take. It, it's in us. It's in us, but it has to also be taught because the people some who are let's face it, bigots and bigoted and oh, they couldn't live there. They couldn't accept a woman. No. 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 It's not it's not you to bring it back. Who oh, no one told me to bring it back. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's my husband talking to the male person. They're supposed to be bringing us something and I guess they didn't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, yeah, Phyllis, I, I agree with you. I think that um, that bigotry and racism and division is taught at home when children mm -hmm. are very young. I agree with you. I said that, definitely. Yeah, and people, I, I agree with you, and people live it and their children see it and that's how it's passed down from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Three Pines seems to paint a picture. I have not read any of Louise Penny's books, but I think I will. Oh. Um, <laughs> of um, a community where... Um, People are accepted for who they are, and they're not only accepted but respected for what they have to offer the community. Mm -hmm. Even even if they seem so eccentric, mm -hmm. you um, it's embracing people in the wholeness of their humanity. You know, I also think. Uh, the transient society where people are moving right and left, you know, and worse, we had a speaker a few months ago who was talking about the difference between Republicans and Democrats, let's put it this way. And people wouldn't move into an area if they thought the neighborhood was Republican or Democrat, depending upon their bias themselves. I mean, they did studies on that. that and who years ago would have thought that you have to ask your neighbor <laughs> or, you know, let me hear about who you're voting for. Well, <laughs> I don't know now. That might be a smart thing to do. I'm sorry. That was a political think, statement. No, I, I, but, I, I agree with you. I'm not too sure that that's a bad idea in the current environment. <laughs> right. But it's going to be better. outnumbered. Yeah. Joanne, it's going, I think it's going to be better. I was just I'd like I was just going to add my experience of watching a lot of stuff going on television mm -hmm. because the hours that we spend, I don't just sit in front of television and watch what's going on. I knit. I'm getting so many of my projects finished because <laughs> I'm watching hours of television and I'm knitting all the time. Yeah. So that's the way I justify it. So. That is wonderful because that is making good use of your time. Yes. Absolutely. Joanne? Otherwise, I, I, I would leave myself the wasting time. I, I read library books. <laughs> ah, that's always good. I would well, like I found funny in the beginning if, when I return a book. No, this is a good thing. The book goes into quarantine for two days. <laughs> yes. So I have to wait. You know, I have a book on hold. I have to wait for it to be clean enough for me to come and get it. <laughs> I don't mean, I mean, externally clean. <laughs> This is a strange world. Yeah, no. You it's know, a strange some world. Of the, some of the practices that we do now, I think will, will last a long time. Mm -hmm. Not just because of the pandemic, but because they are good practices. We should wash your hands. <laughs> yes, 
one of the interesting things about this, and this is from my husband, the ID guy, um, mm -hmm. the flu, we're having a very low flu season. Yeah. There, there is no flu. Because um, nobody's out and about. Right, yeah. and we're all wearing masks and right. washing our hands and staying apart so we're not spreading the flu. Right. That's right. Which is a good thing. That's a, it is a good thing. Joanne, yes. I would just like to add oh. that um, I'm, I'm here. I loved every minute of it. Thank you for your presentation. Oh, Joanne and I have a college roommate. <laughs> oh, I was like, who's that? <laughs> every word. And I, I have read several of uh, Penny's books. And no matter what the trauma is, you know, they're, they're stuck in the ice and they're um, <laughs> trying to shovel the car out. And her, her imagery is so clear. But the solace of arriving at the fireplace, uh -huh. three pines, and the, you can just, it's so sensory. You can um, feel the heat of the fireplace. You can, um, you know, you can taste what they're eating and so forth. It's, it's just fantastic. Oh, this is so special. <laughs> oh, you didn't know I was on. No. Oh, oh my God. God. you can tell she's so surprised. Yeah. And delighted. Of course, yeah. yeah. And I've, I've been wondering about those um, very odd people in Three Pines. And you get, <laughs> frankly, it's the artist who's always confused me. I don't, I don't understand where she's come from. But now she's a I. She's a bit know. of a space cadet. <laughs> okay, okay. I just couldn't quite grasp her. But now I'm going to look back at. The, with um yeah, yeah the characters in those things. the way to understand clara is um that's my name ah well one of the ways to understand clara is to see what she does with her portrait of ruth oh i remember that when she makes her the madonna no one else in the village can understand how clara can make ruth a madonna and it's that last, um, she touches the art. Joyce, you, you, you know art. And she puts the one dot on the picture that makes it universal, that makes Ruth universal. And it's Clara's ability to cut through and see that, that kind of makes her like a mad genius. Hmm. Okay. You gotta go back and get past her hair. <laughs> <laughs> well, the next time, I'm sure all of us, the next time we read one of these novels, it's going to be a lot different than, um, I mean, we're going to have such a depth of- Oh, yeah. And <laughs> well, thanks to you. And of course, it's always I, good to find out who did it. Yeah, oh. <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much. You were absolutely wonderful. You, Thank you, Phyllis. you gave us such an uplifting way of looking at life and you do it. And I know you and John and your family and I wish you and all of you a good, good New Year's. Everyone should be healthy and happy and smiling and laughing. <laughs> and, God and willing. Reading. And reading. And reading. <laughs> reading, yeah. I keep waiting for my book to come. Spoken like the librarian, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Uh, Grace, I see you. I just figured out how to do that. <laughs> yeah, the gallery view or the individual. Yeah, <laughs> Joyce, can I ask you a question? Where are you come? Where are you uh, accessing from? Of me? Are you asking me? Yes, I'm in Washington D.C. Yeah, that's what um, I figured. No, no, the no center wonder, of the universe. Right? No, <laughs> when, no wonder Joanne's so excited because you know, really the rest <laughs> of us are here from. South Orange or Maplewood. And we live downtown, so um, although it hasn't, it's been quieter than. It's been I, quiet today. It, well, it's quieter yeah. usually when there's something happening. We yeah. have helicopters circling overhead, and we have um, you know endless sirens and so forth. But we really haven't had that today or yesterday. But. I think there's 